So thank you all uh, very much for coming to these, this YCEI workshop, Yale Climate and Energy Institute workshop. Um, and I'd like to thank the Yale Climate and Energy Institute for funding it. The director is right there, Mark Pagani. You can thank him personally. <laughs> um, so um, the YCEI likes to fund these sort of interdisciplinary workshops. And so there are lots of these going on, on and off. Um, my name is Mary Louise Timmermans, for people who don't know me, and I'm an assistant professor in the geology and geophysics department. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for coming long distances. We've gathered together quite a crowd of um, interdisciplinary speakers with a broad range of expertise and a broad range of topics. And the general theme for today is a series of talks that looks at uh, um, high-latitude, long-term climate parameters, environmental parameters, spanning timescales from thousands of years to the present day, and talks also on the human history and archaeological record in the high-latitude and Arctic. Um, and so the motivation for this workshop is the understanding that we can learn a lot more about uh, both human history and climate through the integration of environmental um, knowledge with studies of the archaeological record. And so that's, that's the main motivation for this workshop. And tomorrow will really just be a discussion, a discussion session among um, a very broad, with a, with, uh, a broad range of um, expertise in the room, and it will be a, really a conversation between all of these, these different disciplines to try to um, pin down what are some of the big, big issues and how can we make advances through these interdisciplinary collaborations. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, let's have lots of questions and interaction throughout the day, lots of discussion as much as possible. And I'm going to kick off with our first um, speaker. So I'll introduce Jennifer Francis, who's our first speaker. Um, by the way, we've had a slight change in the schedule. Unfortunately, um, Astrid Ogilvie was going to come, and she is a speaker at 11.45, and she couldn't make it. So, um, but in her place, we have a very special speaker, um, Ray Bradley from UMass Amherst is going to give us a talk. Um, and the title of his talk is Holocene Arctic Climate Variability, Past, Present, and Future. So that's a slight change. So let's start with Jennifer Francis. Jennifer Francis is a research professor at the Rutgers Institute of Marine and Coastal Sciences and studies Arctic climate change and Arctic global climate linkages. She co-founded and co-directed the Rutgers Climate and Environmental Change Initiative. And most recently, Jennifer is very well known for her work understanding the relationship between Arctic warming and our weather patterns here in the mid-latitudes. And today she's going to tell us <clears throat> about rapid Arctic warming and changing weather patterns in mid-latitudes. Is there a connection? Thanks, Jennifer. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for inviting me to be here, Mary Louise. It's really fun to be in this group. And I love these interdisciplinary groups because I always learn so much about a lot of different topics that I don't usually think about very much. So hopefully what I'm going to talk about is something that you're not used to thinking about either. Um, and I realize that there um, are mostly not atmospheric science people in the room, so I will try to keep this at a relatively easy to understand level. But if you have any questions along the way, please yell or throw something or whatever you need to do to get my attention. So I hearing you describe this workshop, I realize that I'm definitely at one end of the temporal spectrum of this uh, discussion that we're having here. My archaeology goes back about 30 years, uh, so definitely on the short end of things. But I would like to tell you a little bit about this very recent work that I've been doing and that now a lot of other people are focusing on as well, and that is the fact that we know the Arctic is warming very rapidly, two to three times faster than the rest of anywhere else on the planet, and 
we think that there's a direct connection to mid-latitude weather patterns, in particular certain types of extreme weather patterns. So I've been doing this work together with my colleague Steve Avris at the University of Wisconsin. So let's start with a painful memory. Um, on a beautiful day like this, this memory is starting to fade, but this was actually Chicago for most of this winter. And there, I'm still hearing whining from a lot of my friends and colleagues in the middle of the country, and we were spared somewhat on, in the East Coast here, but this is what they faced all winter long. This was the attack of the polar vortex, which was all over the news. And a friend of mine sent me this cartoon, which I think summarizes the sentiment of people um, in the middle of the country pretty darn well. This was in the New Yorker. But if we look back only two years, so here we are back in the winter of 2012, we see a very different picture. Instead of seeing very cold temperatures over the eastern two-thirds of the country, we saw extremely warm temperatures. And during this March of 2012, we broke thousands of high temperature records, not cold. So keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that. And just to remind you of some of the other extreme events that have happened around the Northern Hemisphere in the last couple of years. Over the last two or three winters, we've had nor'easter after nor'easter in New England. This was in Situate, Massachusetts, near where I live. Of course, last winter, the UK was bombarded with storm after storm. They broke their all-time um, rain record or, or precipitation record going back 250 years. Alaska, a couple years ago, had unprecedented flooding in southeast Alaska. And even Greenland has been experiencing flooding like they've never seen. And then there's the cold. Europe has had some very cold winters, as had uh, much of Asia, especially uh, Western Eurasia. And that cold has extended all the way down to the Black Sea, to the north coast of the Mediterranean. And some of the inhabitants of Eastern Europe have been very upset by this change in the weather. So they're just not happy. And in northern Japan, where they're used to getting a lot of snow, they have been seeing record amounts of snow. I mean, you can't even imagine the snowplow that keeps that road clear. And then again, there's been the heat waves um, all across the northern hemisphere in the summers. But this picture looks like a typical heat wave, but in fact, this was in March in Burlington, Vermont in 2012. All across the country, especially in the West and Southwest, they've been dealing with heat waves and droughts. Texas, a lot of the marinas there are no longer marinas. Eurasia, as well, has been dealing with heat waves and droughts. And of course, we know California is in a very, uh, very bad situation right now. So what do these particular extreme events have in common? They're all related to weather patterns that are basically been stuck or very persistent weather patterns. So when I talk about extreme weather events, I'm not talking about tornadoes or hurricanes or hail, but I'm talking about extreme events that are related to weather patterns that are very slow moving and persistent. So people are starting to notice that weather is changing. And they're starting to ask what the heck's going on, in particular, whether there's a connection to climate change. And it hasn't been very long that scientists, people studying this problem, have been willing to step up and say that, yes, there is a connection. There have been enough new studies lately making some direct links between climate change and extreme weather events that I think we can now say that there are some direct links. Not all extreme events, of course, but certain types. So I like to step back and remind everybody of the pickle that we've gotten ourselves in. You've all seen a graph like this many times, or most of you have, I'm sure. Looking back in time, 430,000 years, and we see that temperature in red here has uh, oscillated back and forth over the millennia. We know what causes that. It's changes in the Earth's orbit, changes in the tilt of the Earth, and we know that the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere changes um, alongside the temperature changes until you get up to recent times. And we see that carbon dioxide has spiked very, very rapidly, and we know that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere now is higher than it's been in at least 800,000 years. 
But we also notice that the temperature has not yet caught up with this very high level of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere now. And we know why that is too, because the oceans are like a big flywheel in the climate system. It takes a lot of energy to warm them up, and it takes time for them to equilibrate with the amount of carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere. But we also know that the last time we had this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, sea levels were much higher, the earth was several degrees warmer, and this is the, the path that we're headed on right now. And we also know that the earth is starting to catch up in terms of its global average temperature. So going back only a thousand years now, we see that temperatures fluctuated somewhat around an average with a general cooling trend overall, but more recently we've seen the temperatures start to spike on the global average. And many of the, of the warmest years we've recorded have been only in the last couple of decades. We also know this warming that's happening is not uniform across the Earth. So as we look at temperature anomalies for the last decade or so, we see the red colors are concentrated up in the far north. The Arctic is warming much faster than everywhere else. And interestingly, uh, this warming that's been happening has been very steady. And in fact, the past, this past March was the 349th month in a row that was above average. So if you're younger than 29 years old, you have never experienced a month that was cooler than average. Not only is the atmosphere getting warmer, it's also taking up more moisture. And we can see that this plot going back to the 1970s or so shows a definite increase in the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, and that increase is completely consistent with the amount of warming that's happened in the atmosphere as well, about a 7% increase in water vapor with a one degree warming. And we know this is important because that water vapor does a couple of things. It not only provides more moisture for any storm that forms now, so we see heavier precipitation events as a result, but it also provides a lot of energy for any storms that form now. But as we look to the future, using climate models, we know that the changes in precipitation patterns are also not going to happen evenly around the globe. So uh, this is a projection for the end of the century, uh, for December, January, February on the left, and summer months, northern hemisphere summer on the right, and you don't need to see the detail, but it shows basically that the dry areas on the planet will become even drier, and the moist areas, especially in high latitudes, will become even wetter. At least that's what the models say. So taking the temperature changes and the moisture changes into account, one of the analogies that you can use is that Mother Nature is now playing with a different deck of cards. So if you wanted to play poker with Mother Nature, she's now got a couple of extra aces and kings in her deck. So you've got a better chance of getting a good hand if you're playing poker than you used to, but you don't, you're not necessarily going to have a good hand. So moving up to the Arctic now, which is where I've been focusing most of my attention over my career, I'm sure you all know that the sea ice in the Arctic is now has changed dr dramatically. So as we, if we look back only 30 years, so this is the end of summer uh, in 1980 when the sea ice, which is the pink stuff floating there on the Arctic Ocean, is at its minimum extent, this is what it looked like back then. So it pretty much filled up the whole Arctic Ocean. But if we fast forward now to 2012, we see that the amount of sea ice in the Arctic has now decreased by half. In only 30 years, we've lost half of the aerial coverage of sea ice. And if you take into account the thickness changes of that sea ice, what we find is that 75% of the volume of sea ice has been lost just in the last 30 years. And what's left, you can kind of see from the color differences compared to the 1980 image, the sea ice that's there now is thinner, it's broken, it's fragile, so any anomalies that come along in the winds or the ocean currents have a much bigger impact now than they would have 30 years ago. But people ask, well, how unusual is this? Is this just a, a short-term blip in what's happening in the Arctic? Well, we can actually look back about 1,500 years using sediment cores and estimate how much ice there was in the summertime in the Arctic Ocean, and that's what's being shown here. So what you see going back about 1,500 years, 
Yeah, there, it wiggles around from year to year. But until you get to present here, which is this blue dotted line, and you can see that now we're in completely uncharted territory compared to the last 1,500 years. But this graph doesn't even have 2012 on it. And if you want to put 2012 on there, you really have to redraw the graph. Can you say a little about how the reconstruction is made? Um, I don't know a lot of detail about it, but my understanding is that the sediments at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean um, contain dead organisms, and those organisms differ depending on whether there was ice floating on the surface or not in the summer. So you can reconstruct the area of the ice based on the type of organisms that were there in the in the muck. We're going to learn a little bit more from Dennis's talk shortly too. Cool. So not only was 2012 a tough year for the sea ice, but it was also a tough year for other aspects of the Arctic. For one thing, we know that the amount of snow on high latitude land areas has been decreasing dramatically. So this is going back to the late 1960s, showing the amount of snow during June, but May and July months look exactly the same. And starting around the mid-90s or so, we've had this very dramatic decline in the amount of snow on high latitude land areas. The reason that's important is because if we're losing that snow much earlier in the spring, that exposes the soil underneath to the strong spring sunshine that dries out the soil earlier warms up the land earlier, and that gives a jump start to the summer season. So we think this is contributing to the increasing tendencies for heat waves and droughts on the northern hemisphere continents. And we've done some work on that that demonstrates this is happening. We can also look at Greenland over the last couple of decades and see what's been happening there. If we go back to 1992, the orange areas here on the surface of Greenland show you what parts of the, of the snow on top of Greenland underwent some amount of melting during that summer. So there you have 1992. Only a decade later, you see that that area has increased dramatically. 2005, only three years after that, ex it ex uh, expanded more. And in 2012, 97% of the surface of Greenland underwent some melt. That was the year that that flood happened that I showed you in the beginning. The changes are just amazing. So why do we care about the loss of ice and snow in the Arctic? Well, we know that ice is very bright, it's very white. Here I'm showing again the 2012 ice cover here in white, and this pink line shows the average for the last few decades. As the sun hits that very white ice, most of the solar energy gets reflected right back to outer space. It never enters the climate system at all. But because we have so much less ice now, much more of that energy from the sun is going into the Arctic Ocean. It's warming the Arctic Ocean, accumulating there all summer long. So and that's part of the reason why the Arctic is warming so fast. This is one of the main factors. And why do we care about that? Well, we're going to learn a little meteorology here for some of you who don't, aren't meteorologists. Let's think about a layer of atmosphere, a layer of air extending from here in New Haven, Connecticut, all the way to the Arctic. And we know that warm air takes up more room than cold air does. Warm air expands. So this layer of air is thicker here in the vertical than it would be in the Arctic. So this layer of air forms a hill, if you will. So if you were sitting on top of this layer here in New Haven, You'd, you, it would be like you were looking downhill as you were looking towards the north. So the air on top of this layer wants to flow down that hill, just like water wanting to flow down the hill of a mountain. It starts flowing, which creates a wind, and because the earth is spinning, that wind gets turned to the right. And that becomes what we call the jet stream. The jet stream is this high a ribbon of fast-moving air high over our heads. Now, because the Arctic is warming so much faster than it is here in New Haven, the thickness of that atmospheric layer is increasing more in the Arctic than it is here. So the effect is that that hill is actually becoming less steep. So there's less force driving that wind that becomes the jet stream. So we'd expect to see the west to east winds of the jet stream decrease as a result of Arctic amplification, we call it, which is the extra warming that's happening in the Arctic. 
So we can actually measure the speed of those winds, and that's what's being shown here, going back to the late 1970s. So the solid black line there is the speed of the wind about halfway up through the atmosphere and how it's changed over since the late 1970s. There's been about a 10% decline on average around the northern hemisphere during the fall. And I show the fall mostly because that's when the effect of the sea ice loss is the largest. And this extra warming in the, at, in the atmosphere in the Arctic is the largest. And you can see also plotted on there is what's been happening with the sea ice extent at the same time. So as the sea ice has really started to, de to decline, so has the speed of the wind. And we know that when those upper level winds become weaker, the jet stream tends to take a wavier path as it travels around the northern hemisphere. So you can remember this with this little tongue twister, weaker westerly wind is wavier. So we can, the, the reason this is important is because if those waves are in fact becoming wavier, if they're becoming larger, we know that those waves tend to move more slowly from west to east. And that's what's being shown in these animations here. So up in the top panel here, these waves have a smaller amplitude. They tend to shift from west to east fast. But as the waves get larger, which is shown down in the bottom here, they tend to slow down and move more slowly from west to east. So why should you care about that? Well, let's take a look at what the jet stream really does. So here's a schematic of the jet stream, that orange um, line that goes across the northern hemisphere there. The first thing to notice is that it separates the cold air to the north from the warm air to the south. So depending on whether the jet stream is north or south of you determines whether you're in cold air or warm air. But also, even more important, are these waves that I was talking about. And depending on where you are relative to one of these waves, it, those waves determine the weather that is happening where you are. So if you're in this part of the wave, where the winds are coming from the southwest, high over your head, you're in a very stormy pattern. And if you're in this part of the wave, where the winds are basically from the northwest, you're in a very dry, settled pattern with high pressure. So, this means that if these waves are moving more slowly from west to east as they get larger, so these weather uh, conditions that those waves create is hanging around longer in your location. This is the idea. So now let's take a look at the real jet stream. And you'll see that it doesn't look quite like this nice, simple orange line. So here we are looking down on the Arctic and these are real winds that have been mapped by NASA's uh, Science Visualization Studio. The red colors here are showing you where the winds are the strongest, indicating where the jet stream is. And as I put this in motion and we rotate down over North America, what you're going to see is that, first of all, the atmosphere is a terribly messy place. There are waves of all kinds and sizes. There are swirls happening all over the place, and these waves um, move sometimes very quickly, sometimes very slowly. So I'm going to show this one more time because I want to point out some conditions when you'll see that when the waves are smaller, they move quickly, as I said, across, um, across the northern hemisphere, and when they're large, they slow down. So here's a case when the waves are quite small, and when I put it in motion again, you'll see that they move quite quickly across the continent, and then there are times when the waves get much larger like this, and you'll see that they tend to get pretty much stuck in place. And that means the weather that they're creating is also being very persistent um, in those locations where those waves aren't moving. And at sometimes they even create eddies, like you saw in the end there. And that becomes very persistent. Okay. So how do you measure something like this? You saw how messy the atmosphere is. How can we measure what's happening with these waves in the jet stream? Well, one of the ways we do it is we map that layer of atmosphere that I showed you that was thicker here than it was in the Arctic, and we can treat it just like a topographic map that you'd use for hiking. So here's a topographic map of that layer of the atmosphere. The red colors are where the, the atmosphere is thicker or the land would be higher, and the purple colors show where there'd be a valley or the colder air. And these black lines indicate where the height of that layer is the same. 
So it's just like on a topographic map for hiking. If you followed one of those lines, you'd stay at a constant elevation. And that's what's being shown here as well. So these lines then uh, we can use to track the shape and size of these waves in the upper level flow of the atmosphere. You can see those waves as you, there's a big, um, way, big northward swing in the jet stream. The jet stream is identified by where these waves, uh, where these lines are very close together. That's where the wind speeds are very strong. And you can see that there are places where there are big dips in the jet stream. So these big north and south swings. So we can look at these maps like this every single day and track the sizes of these waves. So here's a sort of zooming in on the, on the, um, you, on the North Atlantic here, the same topographic map of the atmosphere. And what we see is one of these big waves in the upper level flow. And in fact, it's formed what we call a blocking high. And that's when we get one of these eddies breaking off and forming a circulation pattern in the upper atmosphere. And these are called blocking because when they form, they tend to block the atmosphere in place and lock it in place. And the weather patterns associated with that wave don't change. These create very, very persistent weather patterns. There's been a lot of focus on these blocking highs that over the years um, because they are, have such a big impact on weather patterns, and in particular, extreme weather. But what we've been noticing as we look at particular extreme events is that many of these events are not associated with blocking highs per se, but instead are just very amplified or very large waves in the upper level flow, like this case in March of 2012, which was a bit the big heat wave in the eastern half of our country. This was a big flooding event in Spain where they had, there's Spain right there, where they had um, the worst flooding they've had ever in uh, September. Again, just a big wave, no blocking. This is the situation when Japan had that very heavy snowfall. There's Japan right there. Another case, this is this past winter, actually, when we were attacked by the polar vortex. So we have shifted our focus in our, in our work from these blocking events to just extreme wave events. And the way we're measuring that is going back to our topographic maps and picking a particular constant elevation contour that tracks the shape of these waves in the upper level flow. So this is showing you an example of one of these. And we look for cases when the uh, farthest northern uh, latitude and the farthest southern latitude of this contour is large. It's a very simple technique, but with a different focus. And when we do that and we track these extreme waves over time, what we find is that they are, in fact, increasing in frequency. And that's what's being shown here in the green line. This is very new work that hasn't been published yet. This is for the whole northern hemisphere during fall. And the green line is showing you the frequency of these uh, extreme, extreme waviness events, if you will. And also plotted on here is the upper level west to east wind speed. So I mentioned that when the upper level winds weaken, we tend to get a wavier flow. And this is supporting that idea. If we focus in on the, just the North Atlantic here, we see an even stronger response with a very uh, large increase in these extreme events. So to wrap up here, I just want to show you a couple of particular extreme events and show you what the jet stream looked like at the time that they occurred. So again, here's that heat wave of March 2012, um, where we broke thousands of high temperature records across the eastern two thirds of the country contrasted with this past winter. And you can see that the patterns are almost exactly opposite. So now you guys know all about jet streams, so you can almost predict what the jet stream will look like in these two cases, right? So March 2012, here we have what the jet stream looked like, a big southward dip over the western half of the country, big northward swing or a ridge over the east, letting that warm air extend all the way up uh, into, the, into Canada. And here's the case for this past winter. This, this pattern was in place from early December through most of February. It was, it's been called the ridiculously resilient ridge. Um, that's the ridge that's over the western um, west coast there because it hung around for so long. This is going to be the topic of research for the next few years for sure. Uh, record snows in Alaska, 
This is an image showing you what the actual jet stream looked, looked like at that time with Alaska up here and here's California. We had this big southward dip over the Pacific, allowing the cold air from the Arctic to penetrate southward, and the jet streams bringing a lot of moisture in from the Pacific, the perfect ingredients for heavy snow. But notice the very, very amplified pattern in the jet stream. That flooding in Spain I mentioned, here's what the jet stream looked like then. This was in September. Again, a very, very amplified flow to the jet stream, bringing a lot of moisture in from from the Atlantic Ocean right into Spain. So just to wrap up this concept here, we know that the Arctic is warming very fast. This image is showing you how that layer of the air I described, how much thicker it's gotten over the last couple of decades. The red colors indicate that it's, the thickness has increased much more over the Arctic than it has everywhere around to the south. That is leading to a weakening of the west to east winds in the upper level flow. We can measure this. And this, we believe, is leading to a change in these waves in the jet stream from what we call a zonal flow, which is when the waves are smaller, to the orange color when they're much larger. And those larger waves shift eastward more slowly, as do the weather patterns they create. And this tends to cause these types of very persistent patterns like we had this winter, where we had very persistent cold over the eastern half of the country and warmth in the west. And all kinds of other extremes are related to these waves in the jet stream as well. But this isn't the only game in town. We know that there's a lot of other uh, large-scale patterns in the atmosphere. The questions are, how is this relatively new change in the climate system, which is this recent warming of the Arctic only in the last 15 years or so, how is it going to interact with things like El Nino and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and a variety of other um, things that go on in the climate system like that? So there's a lot of work to be done yet. This is uh, a new hypothesis, if you will, and uh, there's a lot of people working on it, including us. But I think um, it's been useful because uh, the public has really kind of glommed on to this idea. They're really interested in weather. People love to talk about weather. And they're understanding now that climate change is not going to be this gradual warming that's only going to affect their grandchildren. It's happening today. We're seeing it in increasing extreme weather events. And we're starting to understand the connection between weather and climate change. So thanks. And if, I, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them.